Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I would like to introduce everyone to Surya uh, Ganjali, uh, who's uh, a researcher at uh, an applied physics professor, or applied, I'm sorry, associate professor in applied physics at Stanford, where he leads the Neural Dynamics and Computation Lab. Uh, he had triple majored in physics, math, and EECS at MIT, and then got a PhD in string theory at Berkeley, uh, and has uh, been uh, sort of a, a, a well-renowned, well-regarded researcher in the field, having won several awards from a Terman Award, a Burroughs Welcome Career Award, a NERP's Outstanding Paper Award, He's gotten an NSF career award, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on, uh, but and long and short is I'm extremely excited to hear his work. Um, and I would, uh, with that, I would love you, for you to start. Okay, thanks uh, Keith for the intro. Um, let me just share my screen real quick. Um, uh oh, where did it go? Um, I have way too many things on my screen, so I'll just share my desktop and then, um, Let's see. Okay. Yeah, perfect. We can, we, yeah, we can see it now. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I was going to talk sort of, uh, you know, I work at the intersection or union of, of sort of machine learning, neuroscience, and, and, and physics, but I, I realize this is an AI audience, so I kind of tailored this talk to, to machine learning. But just to, you know, give you kind of a quick overview of the types of things we work on, we actually spend a lot of time uh, working in close collaboration with uh, experimental neuroscientists trying to understand how various neural circuits uh, work uh, and, and enable various behaviors in animals. So we, we've modeled the retina, I'll talk a little bit about that. We've modeled how, we've, we've developed theories for how flies detect motion, how monkeys reach, how mice learn and so forth. But there's, there's kind of a bigger story, I think, you know, unfolding uh, that will be unfolding over, the, over many years, which is the following. There's strong motivations for, for an alliance between theoretical neuroscience and theoretical or, or applied machine learning. And that's kind of laid out in the following argument, right? We, we all, you know, at least in neuroscience, we're all in it for the game because we want to understand how the brain works. But what does that actually mean, right? Um, well, a more proximal version of that question is, is we'd like to understand how the connectivity and dynamics of a neural circuit gives rise to behavior. And also how neural activity and synaptic learning rules conspire to self-organize useful connectivity that subserves behavior. Now, the field of machine learning has generated a lots and lots of really interesting learned neural networks that accomplish amazing functions now, functions that we know of no other way of accomplishing uh, in any other artificial system at the moment, right? So this raises a little bit of a nightmare for neuroscientists because we can do any experiment we want on these artificial systems. We know their connectivity, we know their dynamics, we know their learning rule, we know their entire developmental experience, yet we don't have a meaningful understanding of how they learn and how they work, right? So in a situation where we have complete knowledge, we have complete knowledge of the system, but no understanding, uh, nor do we have a benchmark for what that understanding would look like. So we've actually also been working uh, you know, on various artificial neural networks, trying to understand how they learn and, and how they work. And in the process of, so, so, we've, so this is kind of a, a smattering of papers that we've been working on. None of these are neuroscience papers. They're all machine learning and AI papers, uh, trying, to un, uh, trying to understand how artificial neural networks work. And in the process of doing that, we actually use a lot of tools um, uh, from physics, uh, applied physics, applied mathematics, uh, things like non-equilibrium system mechanics, dynamic mean field theory, statistical mechanics of random landscapes to try to understand, uh, in contrast, the, the, the training error landscapes of neural networks, uh, you know, Ramanian geometry, random matrix theory, free probability theory, and so forth. So there's a really nice kind of intertwining between uh, neuroscience, physics, and mathematics, and machine learning that I think will be a really interesting sort of area going forward. Um, it has a little bit of a different style of the work where, you know, you do rigorous proofs in, uh, in machine learning. Um, but in any case, uh, if you're interested in this line of work, we tried to write a coherent uh, overview with, uh, with uh, some colleagues at Google and, and at Stanford uh, of this line of work. And this appeared in annual reviews of condensed matter physics, but we tried to write it for a general audience. Um, and so this is a review that, that talks about these methods and, and addresses fundamental questions in, in, in deep learning, like uh, you know, what can deep neural networks express that shallow networks cannot? What is the shape of the error landscape of neural networks? How do signals propagate through neural networks and what implications does that have for initialization? 
uh, theories of generalization in deep learning um, and, and deep imagination or how, how, generative, uh, how generative models learn and work. So, um, you know, if you're interested in sort of a slightly different flavor of, uh, you know, the same kind of uh, subject, uh, you know, you could try this review article if, if you want. Um, okay, so for, for today, um, I, I'm going to kind of kind of do a selected tour through this body of work, uh, selecting topics that would be of interest to in machine learning. So we're, we're not really going to, you know, do neuroscience, except for one part where we use machine learning to derive from first principles neuroscientific systems like the retina. So I'll start off sort of very simple and basic and shallow, but a very basic question about regression in high dimensions. Remarkably, there's lots of open questions still in that field of, of how do you do regression in high dimensions. In particular, we're going to ask, what's the optimal way to do regression in high dimensions? Right? And then generalization, we're going to try to develop a theory of just even how simple neural networks can predict the response to new examples. Um, then we'll talk about uh, one application of machine learning to neuroscience, uh, which is basically deriving from first principles the properties of the primate retina, um, assuming that the primate retina is an optimal convolutional autoencoder of natural movies. And we'll see out pops the detailed structure of the primate retina from that, from that uh, machine learning assumption. Uh, and then we may or may not have time for these two topics. We'll probably have to pick. One, one fun topic is we're actually, I'm actually playing around with my applied physics colleagues at Stanford where we're uh, developing systems for doing so-called quantum neuromorphic computing, sort of implementing neural networks where the neurons are atomic spins and spin up and spin down as an active or inactive neuron. And the synapses, the atomic spins are connected by uh, photons that, that can flip each other's spins. So the synapses are photons and you get very, uh, you know, low energy fast implementations of neuromorphic computing systems. Um, okay, so let's get started. So, um, for high dimensional data analysis, right? So, so uh, I'm sure this is familiar to many people uh, in the audience, but we've undergone sort of a technological revolution in our ability to collect large scale data sets, right? So that shifts the focus of statistics from classical statistics, where we often collect low dimensional data. Here, the dimensionality of the data is the number of simultaneous features that are required to obtain each data point. Right, and, and let M be the number of data points. So low dimensional data corresponds to data living in low dimensions and you have many, many, many uh, data points. Uh, so the, the, the um, yeah, so, so, so basically in this setting, it's very easy to find regression lines. It's very easy to do clustering and so forth. But what's happening now is because of advances in recording technologies, we, we can record, or record many, many variables at once. For example, we, we can record thousands of neurons in the brain at once in advance of knowing whether those neurons are, are relevant for a task or not, right? But we can also collect maybe these, these high dimensional neural activity patterns for hundreds of trials, right? So what's happening is the number of data, the dimensionality of each data point is becoming large. The number of data points is becoming large, but their ratios order one, right? So a natural question is like, you know, so a caricature of the situation is, you know, you have three points in a three dimensional space and now you have to find clusters and, and, and do dimensional error reduction or do regression or, or whatnot. And this is sort of a challenging regime. Um, so we've been working on, on various aspects of this, both driven by applications in neuroscience and also for pure intellectual interest. Um, and so I'll talk about one word. Oh, by the way, if you're interested, uh, you know, physicists have actually been, believe it or not, physicists have been working on this for quite a long time. And if you're interested in a physics perspective on this subject, um, we wrote a review article a while ago in 2013, if you're, if, uh, if you're interested, where we discuss in a unified way how ideas from physics can be used to understand sort of neural network dynamics, learning dynamics, random matrix theory, random projections, compressed sensing, and, and, and so forth. Um, okay, so let's, let's start with the, just one story now. Okay, so... Um, so, so basically here's the problem, right? So, so what is the way to do optimal regression in high dimensions? So we're going to assume that we, we wanna do theory to, to, to understand what's the best way to do regression. So the best way to do regression, of course, depends on the structure of your data. So we're going to assume a generative model for the data and, uh, and we're gonna analyze what's the best way to do a regression for that generative model. So the generative model is as follows. There's some unknown regression vector S0 that's p-dimensional right? So there's P unknowns in S0, right? The components of S0 are drawn IID from some signal distribution, P sub S. It, it could be non-Gaussian. It's, and it's actually interesting when it is non-Gaussian. Okay, you don't get to observe S0 directly, but you get to 
uh, put inputs into, into this uh, system and measure the outputs. Okay. So, um, and the output is related to the input by taking a dot product with S0 plus some measurement noise, right? The measurement noise, again, could be non-Gaussian and is drawn IID across trials uh, uh, from some noise distribution piece of epsilon, and you get to take N measurements, okay? So you get this training data and your task is to estimate uh, S0 uh, and we'll call that estimate S hat, okay? So the question is, how do you go from training data to an estimate of the unknown regression vector? We're gonna uh, consider a class of algorithms, a general class of algorithms that correspond to minimizing some loss function plus some regularizer. So the loss function, so, so the way we do this is we search over a space of candidate signals S and we minimize over the space of candidate signals, the discrepancy between the predicted outcome had the regression vector been S uh, in the absence of noise and the actual measurement outcome. So this loss function is a monotonically increasing uh, function in the absolute value of this argument. Uh, otherwise, it's otherwise general. And so this measures the uh, prediction error, right? And we'd like to minimize prediction error. We also might want to exploit some prior knowledge about the signal, so exploit some, something about the structure of P sub S. So we also apply some regularizer to the unknown regression vector. And uh, we obtain the estimate uh, through this minimization. Okay, so a wide variety of algorithms correspond to this. In the statistics literature, this is known as M estimation. How do we measure how well we're doing? We're just gonna measure um, how off we are in an L2 sense, okay? So this is the L2 discrepancy between S hat and S0, okay? Of course, we don't have access to this when we're computing S hat, but as theorists, we can just ask for any method of computing S hat, what is this discrepancy? It's monotonically related to the generalization error, right? So in this high dimensional setting where, oh, the other thing is P is, we're working in a limit in which P is going to infinity, N is going to infinity, but the ratio, the measurement density, alpha equals N over P is order one, okay? So in that limit, this L2 error will concentrate to a deterministic value that depends only on the measurement density, your loss function, your regularizer, the noise distribution, and the signal distribution. It won't depend on the detailed realization of the noise or the detailed realization of the regression, unknown regression vector. So then the fundamental question we'd like to ask is, for a given signal distribution, noise distribution, and measurement density alpha, what is the best loss function row and best regularizer sigma we can choose? Okay. So let me pause here and, and just ask if there's any questions about the setup. So I'm just stating the problem that we're attacking. So are there any questions about the setup? I actually can't see the chat. So uh, it, um, maybe Keith, if you can see the chat, you can let me know if there's something there, but otherwise feel free to interrupt at any time uh, if you want. It's always tough to give these talks with no uh, facial feedback from the audience, but anyways. I yeah, assume there's no oh, question. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so, um, okay, ju just to give you examples, right? This is a very general framework and many of the algorithms that we know and love fall into, as, fall into special cases of this framework. For example, least squares corresponds to quadratic loss and no regularization. Maximum likelihood estimation corresponds to the loss function equals the minus log probability of the noise. So you're trying to make the noise likely, the, okay? Um, uh, ridge regression corresponds to squared loss and squared regularization. Lasso corresponds to squared loss and absolute value penalty. Elastic net is also a special case. And an interesting one is map estimation, maximum a posterior inference, where the loss is the minus log probability of the noise and the regularizer is the minus log probability of the signal, right? So, so that's what a Bayesian would do, um, not, not a full Bayesian, they would compute the posterior mean but an approximation might do the approximate, uh, might compute the, the mode of the posterior, okay? Um, okay, so, uh, okay, so, so this is an embarrassment of riches, right? And we'd like to obtain some theoretical insight into out of which of these, which, which one is the best, or maybe none of them is the best, and there's something else that's better than all of them, right? Okay, so we were able to solve this problem. We, we use techniques from statistical physics where um, you know, you can think of this as a physical system that's trying to minimize its energy, where the energy is given by the loss and the regularizer. And so we used ideas from statistical physics to compute the minimum energy configuration, i.e. s hat, 
and to analytically compute the squared error as a function of these variables. So we could do that for, for arbitrary choices of these variables, as long as rho and sigma are convex. That, that's an important uh, constraint for us for technical reasons in the calculation. Okay, so, um, so we were able to answer this question. So what does the answer look like? I'll give you a running example where the noise distribution is the Laplacian noise and the signal distribution is the Laplacian signal. And what we can show is we can show that at very, very high measurement densities where you have a lot of data, the optimal thing to do is actually map estimation. So, so uh, the minus log probability of the noise is the absolute value function. And, and similarly for the signal is the absolute value function. So this is the optimal thing to do if this is your signal and noise distribution. On the other hand, if you reduce your measurement density at lower measurement density, this is map is no longer optimal. Another algorithm is optimal. And the way that you get it is by nonlinearly smoothing the map and the, uh, uh, the regularizer. The, sorry, the loss function of the regularizer corresponding to map. So you get a smoothed uh, loss and a smooth regularizer. And in the limit of very small measurement density, this nonlinear smoothing actually leads to a quadratic loss and a quadratic regularizer independent of what the signal and noise distribution were to begin with, as long as the signal and noise distribution are log concave. Okay, that's again a technical uh, assumption we need. So the statement is, for any log concave signal and noise distribution, the optimal loss and regularizer are nonlinearly smoothed versions of MAP, where smoothing increases as the measurement density decreases. MAP is optimal at high measurement density. Ridge regression is optimal at low measurement density independent of signal and noise. Furthermore, we can show that no inference algorithm or regression algorithm can outperform our optimal algorithm because we can also compute the error of the best possible algorithm, which is computing the posterior mean uh, of S given the data. That doesn't fall into an optimization problem. That falls into a high dimensional integration problem. But we can show that the gap in the error between our optimal minimization problem and computing the posterior mean is zero, right? The, the, the gap in this, uh, in this quantity, right? So that's why no inference algorithm can outperform our optimal algorithm. Okay, if you're interested in the details of all of this, there are two papers. Um, here we compute the optimal algorithm and here we show that the gap is, oh, sorry, here we compute the optimal algorithm and here we show the gap is zero to um, plus the, computing the posterior mean. Okay, so how big is the effect, right? So here, here are, here's, the, here's the results. So on this axis, we have the measurement density. On this axis, we have the fractional, the fraction of unexplained variance. It's, it's Q, it's a Q variable normalized. So it's, this is literally a fraction of unexplained variance. All right, um, the, the error bars are done by numerical simulations of algorithms. The quadratic one is just ridge regression and the, the red one is just map estimation, okay? So th those are numerical experiments. The, the solid curves are from our theory. So these are the results of analytic calculations. And as you can see, there's a very nice match between our theory and our numerics. The black curve is the performance of the optimal algorithm, okay, computed from theory. Okay, and you can see several features here. Even at moderately high measurement densities of order three, right, MAP is doing better than ridge regression. And it will approach, it'll asymptote to this optimal performance here. On the other hand, at measurement densities about less than two or so, ridge regression starts to be outperforming MAP. And then ridge regression achieves the best possible um, uh, algorithm. So I think Christina raised her hand. Maybe Christina, do you wanna um, just ask your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, I can't turn, turn on my video, but can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Uh, was this done on simulated data, on simulations? Yeah, so this was all done on simulated data drawn from this generative model. Have you tried looking at real data? I mean, I know you don't have the actual uh, parameters for real world data, but I'm wondering how things like, you know, multicollinearity or maybe some non-independence of observations, data points might actually affect these. Uh... Yeah, those are, those are excellent. Um, those are excellent questions. We don't know because we don't know what the, the map estimator is for real world data. Um, I should have said that the, um, we're operating in an IID setting where the, uh, the Xs are just uh, random white noise. So you can think of the application domain as white noise systems identification, where you feed white noise to a linear system, you observe the outputs, and you try to understand the, the relationship between input and output. 
our, our theory doesn't apply if the data is correlated. We actually have some a new paper uh, coming out at ICML where we generalize this to just analyzing ridge regression for correlated data. And we find the optimal regularizer for, for ridge regression. So we break that assumption in, an, in some other work that will appear at ICML this year. But this theory, I'm, I'm not dealing with collinearity and those complications for sure. Uh, so there's lots more work to be done uh, on the theoretical side in terms of increasing the sophistication of this generative model. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, okay, so where was I? Uh, yeah, okay, so basically Ridge does the best uh, uh, at, at low measurement densities and it's not a small effect. So for example, if you have a criterion level of performance, let's say around here, you can reduce your data almost by a factor of 75% if you switch from MAP to our optimal algorithm, right? So just switching the algorithm can reduce your data requirements, um, but by, by quite a large amount. Okay, so um, let's see. <laughs> you, you might hear my son on the other side of the, <laughs> of the door. Um, his <laughs> I'm right next to his playroom at the moment. Anyways, but um, let's see. Uh, okay, so let's shift to... Um, uh, deep learning, uh, baby steps towards understanding deep learning uh, and generalization. So a major kind of question is, is, is why do sort of over-parameterized deep neural networks generalize well, right? That's a famous problem at the moment. So, so we looked into this. Um, uh, so what's happening is there, there are many upper bounds on generalization error that often involve some measure of the training error plus some uh, a complexity uh, parameter of the model, like VC dimension, Rademacher complexity, or so forth. But in the settings in which, uh, um, and of course the amount of data, but in the set, if you apply these uh, upper bounds uh, to the regimes in which deep learning is currently successful, these upper bounds are often, often vacuous. They um, predict uh, that the upper bound on the probability of error is something bigger than one. So it's a completely vacuous uh, bound because all probabilities are less than one. So what we decided to do was we tried to, to just analytically compute the entire dynamics of training and test error for a multi-layer neural network. Um, and, and we were able to do that for, for multi-layer uh, linear networks. Now that may seem like a terrible idea, but, but let me explain that it's not entirely, uh, uh, it's not entirely not trivial, right? So, um, you know, the dynamics of learning in deep nonlinear networks is quite complex, right? You, you often get plateaus in the training error, and then suddenly they drop. Uh, the test error can drop, and then it might rise later on, uh, signifying overfitting and, and so forth. Um, it turns out all of this phenomena show up in the learning dynamics of, non -linear, of linear, deep linear networks. And it's not necessarily a consequence of the neuronal nonlinearity. It's a consequence of the non-convexity of the loss landscape, even for linear networks. So just to explain that, imagine you have a very simple two weight layer linear network. The input output map is just the product of the, two, of the weights from layer one to two and, the, and layer two to three. Okay, um, so why is the loss landscape non-convex? Let's just assume that we have squared loss here. So um, basically if you have a squared loss here, the loss function is the desired output minus the actual output squared. The actual output is quadratic in the weights. So the loss function is then quartic in the weights. If you take a gradient with respect to the weights, you get a, a, a cubic function of the weights. And so basically the loss landscape is non-convex. The learning dynamics is non-linear, right? If we analyze the learning dynamics and the limit of very, very large batch size, so basically full batch uh, gradient descent with very, very small learning rates, you can reduce this to a gradient flow system, right? And the, this, this is the dynamics of gradient descent as ordinary of, of gradient flow uh, in this limit. Um, this, is the, this is the dynamics of the weights under gradient descent, and it depends on the training data only through these two correlation matrices, but as promised, the gradient is cubic in the weights. So you get a horribly complicated coupled set of nonlinear ordinary differential equations that are third order in the weights. Okay. What are these correlation matrices? Well, sigma 1, 1 is the input-input correlation matrix. It's how correlated is one neuron with another neuron across the training set. Sigma 3, 1 is an input-output correlation matrix. It's how correlated is an input with an output neuron, an input neuron with an output neuron across the training set, okay? 
So that's where the simplicity comes in because the network is linear. It's learning dynamics is sensitive to the inputs and outputs only through their second order statistics and they show up uh, here, okay? But the learning dynamics is quite nonlinear. Uh, despite this nonlinearity, we were able to find a class of exact solutions to this learning dynamics. Um, and they behave like this. Um, we're gonna simplify our lives and assume that the input is whitened for us. So sigma one, one is the identity. Uh, uh, and and then, then the only thing that drives the learning dynamics is sigma 3, 1, the input-output correlation matrix. And we can find a class of exact solutions where the time-dependent weights of the neural network build up mode by mode the singular value decomposition of the input-output correlation matrix. So these are the singular vectors, the input and output singular vectors of sigma 3, 1. And these are the time-dependent singular values of this uh, product matrix, the, the composite map from input to output. These singular time-dependent singular values have an exact solution. This is a solution. Its principal properties are that it's a sigmoidal function. If you start from small initial weights, it's a sigmoidal function that starts small and, uh, a, and then it suddenly rises at a certain time, right? The time at which it rises is given by the singular value of sigma 3, 1. So what happens is if there's a strong singular value in the input output correlation matrix, that mode, that singular mode gets learned early a weaker singular mode gets learned later, and a final singular mode gets, the, the weakest singular mode gets learned uh, even later, right? And um, this is a special class of solutions from a special class of initial conditions, but we can also run the dynamics from random initial conditions, and we find that this class of uh, solutions is an attracting class of solutions in the entire manifold of initial weight, of weight space. And so this is, these red curves kind of converge to these blue curves pretty quickly. All right, or are well approximated by the blue curves. So this is what uh, you know multi-layer learning dynamics does. It builds up the singular value decomposition, the input-output correlation matrix, mode by mode, um, and then. Um, but what are the take-home messages uh, from this that might generalize to to nonlinear systems? The basic idea is that stronger statistical structure in your data gets learned earlier. Right? The only problem is for nonlinear networks, we don't know what that statistical structure is and we don't know how to quantify it. For deep linear networks, we know what that statistical structure is. It's the input output modes of the correlation matrix and the strength of that statistical structure is the singular value. And so str stronger singular modes get learned earlier. Okay. Uh, we can generalize all of this to multi-layer networks. The equations are slightly different, but they can be solved. I have a question okay. for you. I'm sorry to interrupt briefly, but uh, okay. given this is uh, somewhat similar to ReLU uh, activation functions, is this a better approximation or is this very similar to ReLU? Uh, do you oh, think? Yeah. yeah, sorry, I should have said this just, just so you don't uh, lose my attention. I want to say that at the end of all of this theory, uh, we're going to relax the linearity constraint and switch to leaky ReLUs. And we'll see that the results are qualitatively similar to that of linear networks. The advantage in linear networks, we have complete theoretical insight into what's going on. Uh, we don't have that, for, we, we have quantitative insight into what's going on. Uh, and we only have qualitative insight into the rare loops. But, but yeah, so, so you, you don't have to ignore all of this because you think that everything will change if you add rare loops. It, it won't, uh, qualitatively. Okay. Absolutely, right. thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. <laughs> I, I should have mentioned that uh, earlier on. Okay, now we're, we're gonna talk about generalization. And so then again, I have to talk about a, a, um, a uh, generative model for the data to talk about general, generalization. But before I do that, I just wanted to give you kind of a visceral kind of picture about the learning process because that will help in understanding generalization. So right now, what I've been telling you is, let's say S hat is, this, is a singular value in the training data in Sigma 3.1. And S is the singular value of the student. It's a time dependent function that rises and it rises earlier, the larger S hat is. But alternatively, you could think about it this way. On the horizontal axis is S hat. This is the strength of structure in your training data for different modes. Different modes would have different S hats. And this is the quality of learning, the ratio of the singular value in the student compared to the singular value in the training data. Eventually this will rise to one, right? And we can ask at a fixed time, which singular modes have been learned, right? So at an early time, only singular modes with a very large singular value have been learned. But at a later time, more and more modes of weaker singular value get learned. So you can viscerally view the learning process 
as a singular mode detection wave that sweeps in from large singular values to small singular values. And that's, that's what these networks do, that, that their learning corresponds to a singular mode detection wave. OK, so basically, at a given time t, all singular modes bigger than t are learned up to some proportionality constant. And all singular modes in the training data less than t are not learned. OK, that's the basic take home message. All right, now let's move on to generalization. So this is a, a, another paper uh, now. So, um, so in generalization, you know, I think one of the biggest mathematical impediments to understanding deep learning is we don't have a mathematical model of the very task that we're asking deep neural networks to solve, right? If we really understood the tasks that we're asking them to solve, then and only then might we be able to understand why they solve them, right? So in order to understand generalization, we do need a theoretical model of, of the task. And we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow a well-worn trajectory, especially in the physics literature and a trajectory that has um, uh, raised its head again in, in the you know, mathematical CS literature, which is uh, the student teacher setting. So the idea is we assume that the training data is generated by a teacher neural network and the teacher will always have bars over its quantities denoting ground truth quantities. Right? The training data is obtained by feeding random inputs to the teacher and getting the outputs and those outputs might be corrupted by noise. So there's a noisy teacher involved. Okay. Uh, of course, the, the, I'm going to just assume the teacher is linear. So the only thing that matters about the teacher is the composite weight matrix, the product of weight matrices across the layer. So W bar fully characterizes the teacher. We're going to have uh, training inputs fed to the teacher, and we're going to get the outputs, again, corrupted by noise. So then um, that constructs this training data. We're just going to assume that the inputs are whitened. So uh, sigma 1, 1 is just a, the identity matrix. Um, but we're going to, but, but this is otherwise determined by the teacher. And so this is related to the correlations between the inputs and the outputs. Those correlations are generated by propagating through this weight matrix W bar. And so actually sigma three one in the training set has hiding within it W bar, the ground truth teacher, corrupted by a high dimensional random matrix Z corresponding to the noise, okay? So what we'd like to learn is somehow buried in the training data. Uh, in a non-obvious way through the addition of two matrices. Okay, a signal matrix and a noise matrix. Okay, so now we can couple this to what we've learned before about training. We know that the teacher, the sorry, the student network, so the student network is exposed to this training data and it does what it does. It, it, sends, it, it learns via a singular mode detection wave, right? So it's gonna learn sigma three one. It cannot get direct access to the teacher. It can only get access to the sum of the teacher and the noise. So it will learn what it, the, the singular mode structure of sigma 3, 1. So to understand generalization, we need to understand something about relationships between the singular mode structure of sigma 3, 1 and the singular mode structure of W bar plus Z. We're going to assume that W bar is a low rank matrix. So the teacher is somehow very simple. It has a small number of hidden units. But we're going to assume the student is completely over parameterized. It has as many hidden units uh, as there are inputs and outputs, for example, or, or it's proportional with some proportionality constant. So it's an overparameterized student has many more hidden units than it needs to mimic the teacher, but it will still achieve good generalization error and we'll understand why. Okay. So again, I, the secret to generalization, at least in the simple setting, is understanding the relationship between sigma 3, 1 and W bar, where now sigma 3, 1 is the perturbation of a low rank matrix by a high dimensional random Gaussian matrix. Okay, um, a lot of the random matrix theory for that has been actually been worked out in some beautiful work by these authors. So imagine that sigma 3, 1, or imagine this is the singular value decomposition of W bar. So it has this clean singular value decomposition where S, the S bars are the teacher's singular values and the U bars are the teacher's singular vectors and, 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 and so are the V bars. Sigma 3, 1, in a, uh, unfortunately has a perturbed singular value decomposition, a noisy singular value decomposition. So I'm gonna put hats on the corresponding quantities. What's the relationship between the singular vectors of the, of the training data and the singular vectors of the teacher? Well, it all depends on the strength of the, the teacher's singular modes. I'm going to assume that the noise just has some fixed variance and I'm not modifying. So the signal to noise ratio in this problem is the ratio of the singular mode of the teacher relative of a given singular mode of the teacher to the noise variance, okay, or standard deviation. So, um, so it all depends on the strength of the singular mode in the teacher. If the strength of the singular mode in the teacher is large, 
then it turns out the overlap or dot product between say u hat and u bar will be large and close to one as, this, as the signal becomes large. But there's a phase transition where if the singular mode of the teacher becomes small, there's absolutely zero overlap between the singular mode of the training data and the singular mode of the teacher. So you can learn nothing about the teacher if the signal in the teacher is weak, okay? This is a famous phase transition that was also discovered by physicists. You can view it kind of this way. On this side of the phase transition, there is some signal in the training data about the teacher. On this side of the phase transition, there's absolutely no signal, it's perpendicular, okay? Um, usually this is related to uh, phase transitions in the spectrum, the singular value spectrum of sigma 3, 1. So here's, for example, is a singular value spectrum of, this, of the training data and the singular value sorry, a singular value of the training data and the corresponding singular value of the teacher. For small singular values, it's inflated and it sits at the edge of this noise spectrum. For large singular modes of the teacher, it's close to that of the teacher and it, it sits as an outlier here. This is an example spectrum of the training data for a rank three teacher that has three large singular values. So those three large singular values show up in the training data and their singular vectors are related to that of teacher, but there's a whole bunch of noise singular values, okay? So now let's just intuit what's going to happen as a, the student network learns on this data. The singular mode detection wave will sweep in from right to left. It'll learn the first mode, then the second mode, then the third mode, and then it'll penetrate the noise C, okay? Each time it learns these signal modes, the training error will drop because you learn something about the training, the sigma 3, 1, but the test error will also drop because sigma 3, 1 contains information about W bar. But as you start penetrating the C, you only learn about irrelevant details in the training data. You learn nothing about your teacher. So the training data will drop, the training error will drop, but the test error will rise, okay? All of this intuition can be turned into completely uh, transparent analytic expressions uh, for the entire dynamics of training and test error. Okay, and here's an example. So the solid curves are uh, analytic theory. The triangles are numerical experiments on actual uh, you know, two-weight layer neural networks. And you can see there's a very nice match between analytics and theory. This is a setting where we had a rank one teacher. So this sudden drop is, is when you penetrate the, the one outlier singular mode. And then this continuous drop is when you start penetrating the C. This is the test error. So there's a corresponding drop in the test error when there's a drop in the training error here, but then eventually the test error rises. Okay. Now there's an optimal early stopping time here before the test error arises. And we can ask, what does this, the test error at the optimal early stopping time actually depend on? Okay, well, we can analytically compute this optimal early test error, stopping time test error. And we can show that it, as, as long as you initialize with small initial weights, it doesn't depend at all on the number of hidden units of the, of the student. So the size of the student network doesn't matter at all for uh, computing the generalization error. What does matter is the initial variance and the, um, and the structure of the training data. The structure of the training data is what really matters. In particular, the signal in the teacher relative to the noise. That's the key thing that matters for determining generalization. So largely the generalization error depends only on the structure of the data, not on the size of the student architecture. Okay, okay so um, uh, we can generalize our theory to, to multi-layer linear networks. The dynamics actually changes a little bit, but it's fully computable. So this is a student uh, network where you have a rank N student, a rank one teacher, and there's five uh, layers or three hidden layers of neurons. Again, the same story holds. Uh, this was the comparison to nonlinear networks. So we, we we kept everything the same. We just changed uh, uh, the, the ReLU to a leaky ReLU. And you can see just the qualitative structure of the learning curves completely holds. A sudden drop in training and test early on, a late rise in test, and a late drop in training. If you sort of compare this to this, they're just qualitatively similar. The detailed shapes are different, but they're qualitatively similar. All right, so um, of course this work was motivated by this famous paper, right? Understanding deep learning requires rethinking generalization. This was the paper that showed for typical networks of the large sizes that are used in application settings and deep learning, 
and data sets of the relatively small size used, i.e. the number of data points is much less than the number of parameters. Um, these networks, if you randomize the labels, they can completely memorize a, a training set of randomized labels, right? Yet on the original data, they can generalize really well, right? So this goes against the conventional wisdom in the field that, uh, you know, you can only generalize well if you can't memorize a randomized data set of the same size. Right? There was an interesting finding in that paper, which was that there is still a difference between training on random labels and training on structured data. If you train on the true labels, the loss drops very, very quickly. Okay. But if you train on a data set of the same size, except you just randomize the labels, the loss takes a long time, you know, a relatively longer time to drop. It's a factor of, you know, two or so, two or three or so. Okay, so training on random labels is slower than training on structured labels. Okay, this can also be reproduced in um, deep neural networks, uh, sorry, in deep linear networks, and we can understand completely why. What happens is in the structured data coming from a teacher neural network, there are these outlier singular modes. And so the training error will drop as soon as you pick up the strong structure. So it'll drop early. But if you randomize the outputs relative to the inputs, you destroy the input output correlations and you just have noise. And so the singular mode detection wave will take longer to penetrate this noise and therefore it'll take longer to learn. And this is a repro and so we see that numerically in our, in our um, very, very simple two layer network. So we can reproduce this funny finding just in a very simple system. Um, but but the, the advantage here is we can fully understand what's going on. Okay, so um, let, me, uh, let me, okay. Now let me give you some take home messages and some discussion about what I think will generalize to more general settings with more realistic networks and more realistic data sets. Uh, because of course I, I gave you a story for a simple model and the natural question is like, how much will this generalize? But just to summarize what we actually did so we analytically computed the training and the test error as a function of training time in deep linear networks. The results actually qualitatively reflect learning in deep nonlinear networks with all else held the same. The generalization error as a function of time depends in a sensitive but completely computable way on the initial student weight strength, the teacher rank, and the teacher signal to noise ratios, i.e. the structure of the data. But the generalization error at the optimal early stopping time does not depend in a strong way on the student network size, as long as it's expressive enough, as long as its rank is as high as that of the teacher. Um, these networks learn the most important structure in the data first and then only learn less important structure. So the entire training trajectory matters for understanding generalization, even in the simple system, and it likely matters even in more complex systems. We can explain why learning scramble data takes longer than learning structured data. Any, and we basically show in the simple setting and, and likely in more general settings that any amount, attempt to bound generalization error solely in terms of the complexity of the student architecture or its expressive capacity alone, i.e. things like VC dimension Rademacher complexity, is likely to yield a loose bound. Understanding the data is the secret, I think, to understanding generalization. So, and moreover, so, so to generally to understand generalization, I think we need a theory of the structure of the data as well as its impact on the learning dynamics. And so maybe generalization success in deep learning may originate through a conspiracy between data structure and learning dynamics, as it does in the simple setting, I think that will generalize in, in more complex settings. Somehow nonlinear deep networks are picking up on, on, on important statistical structure that's important for generalization quickly, uh, presumably. Okay, so um, let's see, let me pause there. So, okay, 11.46. So I have time for, oh, by the way, a fun, <laughs> a fun fact is that we actually applied this analytic theory to modeling um, the development of cognition in infants, believe it or not. So as infants develop their cognitive capacities, uh, uh, you know, decades of research in psychology have revealed a wealth of psychophysical phenomena that infants, uh, infants exhibit, okay? My collaborator, Jay McClelland, was looking at deep neural networks and recapitulating all of these psychophysical development phenomena in infants in nonlinear deep networks. And so that was kind of striking to me. And so we looked at that and said, well, you know, would deep linear networks also recapitulate these phenomena? And remarkably, they did. And so for each of these phenomena, we could reproduce them in deep linear networks, not using even just simulations, although we, we did. We could come up with analytic formulas 
whose qualitative structure over developmental time or training time with the deep linear network matched the structure of developmental transitions in infants. So I won't have time to go into that, but if you're interested, there was a paper in PNAS in, in 2009. And it also shows an application of, of, um, of, these, of these linear networks. Now we have other, lots of other theoretical works on deep nonlinear networks looking at their expressive capacity and so forth, but those are sort of stories for another day. Okay, so now let me just give you one, uh, I'll probably only have time to talk about uh, one story from here, which is totally fine. That's sort of what I was expecting, but um, I'll give you a fun story where we now connect machine learning to neuroscience in kind of a satis, I, I think is a satisfying way. Um, so let me, ex oh yeah, I can start here. Okay, so the, the basic uh, question we'd like to ask is we'd like to understand visual processing in the retina. Okay, let me just, uh... Yeah, that, that's the right set of slides. Okay, so we'd like to understand visual processing in the retina. So oftentimes the way we model the uh, visual processing in the retina is, oh, oh so what, what are you looking at here? So these are photoreceptors. These photoreceptors can detect single neurons. This is a hidden layer of bipolar cells. And these are ganglion cells. You all have 1 million ganglion cells in your retina and everything you know about the visual world comes from the 1 million fibers emanating from these ganglion cells in, in your retinas. So we often model these ganglion cells, they're firing as um, the convolute of a spatiotemporal filter applied to the pattern of photoreceptor activations. You can roughly think of this as pixels, right? Luckily, photon and pixel both start with the same letter. Um, anyways, um, you can model these cells using a spatiotemporal filter followed by a rectifying nonlinearity, okay? And these spatiotemporal filters have a lot of structure. Okay, so here are examples. Uh, you, you, by the way, you can roughly view the retina as a convolutional encoder with multiple channels or what neurobiologists would call our cell types. Okay, here are four cell types in the primate retina that, or four convolutional channels, uh, if you will, in the primate retina. The four convolutional channels have different spatial temporal filtering properties. The spatial temporal filter is approximately space time separable or rank one. So it factors into a the outer product of a spatial filter and a temporal filter. Okay, so here are two spatial filters. Um, this cell likes to see a decrement of light in the center and an increment of light in the periphery, so it's called an off cell. This cell likes to see an increment of light in the center and a decrement of light in the periphery, so it's an on cell. And and it has and then you also have these. Um, so these two on and these two on and off cells come in a pair, and they have very large receptive fields and they're slow, they integrate slowly in time. And then you have these midget, so-called midget cells that have small receptive fields and they integrate, uh, sorry, they integrate uh, slow in time and the others integrate fast in time, okay. So the primate retina and our retina also has these four dominant cell types. They make up about 70% of the cell types in the, in, in the primate retina, okay. So a natural question is why did evolution choose this particular set of spatial temporal filtering properties for four of its most dominant convolutional channels. Okay. Um, let me skip this. Oh, this is the paper that I'm, I'm, I'm discussing. Um, let me skip that. So just to review, right? We have uh, these midget cells and these parasol cells. And the, so the midget cells have a small spatial receptive field and are slow in time. There's actually a lot of them and th they don't fire that much. So they have a very low sensitivity to inputs. The parasol cells are large in, in receptive field size and are fast in time. There's, there's, um, they have a low number density, so uh, there's not that many of them. And they're very sensitive, they fire easily, so they have a high firing rate. So a natural question is conceptually, why is space and time intertwined in this fashion? Okay. So what we did was we asked, well, what would an optimal convolutional autoencoder do, right? And so what we did is we modeled the retina. Uh, well, we, we fed it, uh, you know, it's an optimal autoencoder of natural movies. So we fed it natural movies and we assumed a, a convolutional autoencoder either with one cell type or, or, or one channel, oops, sorry, or multiple channels. And we, we kind of wanted to ask what is the um, advantage of having multiple channels in this context? And it does that advantage look like what, the, what evolution shows. So, so the retina is modeled by these filters, okay? 
we think of this, now we score the quality of these filters by asking this to be an, a, a convolutional autoencoder. So we have a linear decoder and we try to reconstruct the movie while fixing the, the encoding uh, vector. And then we ask, or, or encoding channels, and we ask, what are the best encoding channels for just squared error reconstruction? Uh, you know. and, and we ask, can we do better with two channels than with one channel? And of course, we do an apples to apples comparison. When we compare a two channel system with a one channel system, we equalize the number of neurons in the system and the overall firing rate in the system. So we have a, an overall firing rate budget, okay? So we do an apples to apples comparison between these two networks and we ask, can we do better with two than one, two channels than one? Okay, so um, we can actually, for, for linear autoencoders, we can solve this completely analytically and then we can simulate it for ReLU autoencoders, which is a bit more like the retina because the retina has a rectifying nonlinearity. But, let, but in the linear solution, we obtain a lot of conceptual insight into what's going on. So if we think about the structure of natural movies, right? For a linear autoencoder, all that matters is the space-time correlation structure of the natural movie. It's translation invariant, so the space-time structure is diagonalized in the Fourier domain. So, you, so this is the power spectrum of natural movies. K is the spatial frequency. Omega is the temporal frequency. S is the power at a given spatial and temporal frequency. And it turns out the power spectrum of natural movies has this characteristic structure. It's a, it's a joint power law in these two variables. So it has a power law tail out here and a power law tail out here, okay? What happens is we find that even when you control for neuron number and overall firing rate, you can do better, you find a better convolutional autoencoder using two channels than you do with one. And the key reason is the two channels specialize to process these two different lobes of the power spectrum of natural movies, okay? So if we think about you know, what happens, let's think about the channel or cell type that specializes to this lobe. Its spatial filter has power concentrated at high spatial frequencies, which means in space, its spatial filter is narrow or small, right? Now, because it's specializing here, it's also specialized to low temporal frequencies, which means its temporal filter is slow, right? you need to tile these receptive fields to not miss any part of space. Oh, we also optimize the stride, by the way, as well. So the optimal stride, because these cells have a small spatial receptive field, is you need many, many cells because you need a small size because you need the receptive fields to tile space. And because you have many cells and you have a fixed firing rate budget in your optimization, they must fire with very, very low firing rates. On the other hand, the other cell type or convolutional channel is focusing on specializing to this region of the power spectrum of natural movies. And so it's specialized to low spatial frequencies. So its receptive field is wide. And it, it's forced then as a consequence to focus on high temporal frequencies. So its temporal filter is fast. Because you have large receptive fields in order to tile space, you don't need that many cells. So, so there are a few of these cells. Because you don't that, need that many cells, you can allow them to fire more without busting your firing rate budget. So you can fire all of that more. Again, all of this, I'm just explaining intuition, but we have mathematical formulas backing up all of this, okay? Including the quantitative uh, optimal uh, properties. Okay, so then we did a simulation where we optimized the encoding uh, in, a, in a rectifying uh, autoencoder. So a ReLU autoencoder. So the hidden layer is a ReLU. And, and we found that we did better with four cell types. And now you get the split between off and on cells. Uh, you can reduce your firing rate by splitting things into on and off cells. Now, this is the primate retina that I showed you, the four cell types in the primate retina. These are the four cell types that we obtain in an optimal convolutional autoencoder of natural movies uh, with four cell types. And you can see there's a very nice, almost quantitative match between the optimal convolutional autoencoder and the structure of the primate retina. So this suggests that evolution through evolutionary processes indeed found an optimal general purpose signal processing system that's tailored to the statistics of natural movies. Okay? I should emphasize that this is not a species universal result. Okay? The primate is sort of an almost apex predator, right? It doesn't have too much stuff preying on it. Lower animals like rabbits or mice or primates or salamanders, they have very different structure in the retina. So for example, in rabbits, 40% of the cells are devoted to detecting overhead motion. 
because rabbits really have to worry about birds of prey flying down and eating them. So, so evolution found a different solution for prey than it did find for predators. And, and for better or for worse, we are predators. And so we have this uh, similar, or at least we're more predators than prey in the natural order of things. So we have the similar structure of, uh, of a retina. Okay, so I have about three minutes left. I'll just summarize one really cool thing. Uh, th this is, I, I, as a theorist, I've been helping out applied physics colleagues on how to design um, uh, quantum neuromorphic computers. So here's an example of one. Here's a Bose-Einstein condensate where you have atoms that are stuck in this optical cavity and you have light shining back and forth between this cavity. The atoms have spins in them, spin up or spin down. So you can think of the atomic spin as a neuron. It has two states, spin up or spin down. But the photons are bouncing back and forth between the cavity. So they're flipping the spins, they're exchanging the spins. And so there's this connectivity between two spins at, at location I and location J determined by the joint pattern of light. And you can engineer this connectivity to design the connectivity of the neural circuit. And it turns out the dynamics of the spins is this energy minimization dynamics given by this energy function, which looks a lot like a hot field network. So the system can actually store memories in a, in a, and it stores it in a better way because of its natural quantum dynamics than classical hot field networks do. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that, at that overall thing. And uh, there's another type of quantum computer we're working in where the qubits are photons themselves. And we're trying to understand the energy landscape of the system for optimization purposes. And we can actually understand this energy landscape. Uh, just like we, you know, it, it's kind of similar. The, the, the shape of high dimensional error landscapes or energy landscapes over many, many degrees of freedom have certain universal properties that show up in many different settings. And, and we're trying to understand them in as many settings as we can, including early work that we did on deep neural networks. And now we're looking at quantum optimizers over photons. And I'll just leave that as a teaser. Uh, this is the only work uh, that I'm telling you about that we haven't published yet or, or is not an archive, but everything else is on the is on the archive. And if you're interested or a publisher on the archive, so if you're interested, you can you can see these papers and I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, thank you again, Surya. Um, uh, as an aside, of course, we are uh, recording these uh, uh, this uh, talk, but uh, feel free to tell us if, if, for example, the very end points where you'd have unpublished material if you would like us not to uh, to remove that recording before we post it on YouTube, uh, I'm more than oh, happy. Oh, no, no worries. Okay. No, you can totally share it. It's All right, fun. totally. Uh, regardless, uh, this is really fascinating work. As, as someone who, who came from the physics realm and moved to computer science, uh, this is just really, really interesting. So while I do have a few questions, I do want to leave it, uh, I do want to let other people ask uh, maybe one question as it is already noon, uh, do does anyone have questions they would like to ask? Uh, okay, then. Uh, oh, uh, well. So then, one question I have is uh, maybe um, the the biggest question I have is what is the intuition behind the the generalization dip? I mean, uh, as in as in mathematically, of course, the the fact that with training. You can get you can capture more and more of the of the modes of the data that that makes intuitive sense, but what was the what was the mathematical reasoning behind the the generalization dip with, with this uh, teacher trainer uh, model? Oh, you mean you mean this thing, right? Yeah, um, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. So basically, it, it has to do with the following thing, right? Um, if the teacher has a large singular value, right? Mm -hmm. Because remember, I said the learning is like a singular mode detection wave going from right to left. And yeah. the student picks up the structure of the training data here. Yeah. So if the teacher has a large singular value, that singular value persists in the training data, right? Mm -hmm. And its singular mode structure is related to that of the teacher through this overlap, right? Yeah. So what happens is early on, as a singular mode detection wave penetrates this large uh, or crosses over this large singular value, you learn about both the training data and the teacher, so both drop. And then nothing happens for a while because uh, this, was a rank, this was a rank one example. So pretend these two things are not here. Okay. So the singular mode detection wave keeps going and nothing's happening. It's not picking up any singular values anywhere, right? But then it starts picking up more singular values, but these are the noise singular values. I see, right? I see. So they have nothing to do with the teacher. They only have to do with the particular realization of the noise and the details of the X's, the inputs that showed up, 
right? Right, right. So, so that's why nothing's happening for a while, but then the training error rises continuously as, sorry, the test error rises continuously as the training error drops continuously. Yeah. That's the basic we're point. just memorizing noise. I see what you're, you're memorizing noise, yeah. And, you know, there's a period of time where there's nothing to be learned because the weights are still bootstrapping themselves mm -hmm. and they can't pick up anything. Wow. All right. Well, uh, thank you again. And, and I, I would, of course, love to talk to you even more, but, but I know we're out of time. Um, so uh, thank, uh, with that, I think we can stop the recording. And um, 